When I was four, I told my mother I wanted to be a chef. My grandmother was a chef, and my father was a baker. So I think it's just in my bloodstream. If you ask me what my tools are, I would have to say it's my nose and my tongue, not, not my knife. A master chef applies a carefully conceived chain of chemical reactions to raw ingredients. The objective? To stimulate our senses of taste and smell in ways most could never imagine. My main goal is to really leave an impression with people. It's something visceral, something that transports you. People just don't realize, I don't think, how important it is in your whole life to, to be able to smell things. Yeah. For me, it's just a total lack of enjoyment of things that I took for granted. Well, we know a great deal more than we used to with respect to the molecular and genetic component of the sense of smell, but the psychology of smell is still somewhat of a mystery. Our senses of taste and smell were born of our most primitive instincts for survival. But how they shape our interpretation of the world is a puzzle science is only beginning to piece together. the senses that allow us to experience the world on a molecular level. Smells come in countless forms and degrees of intensity. Taste offers far fewer sensations with only sweet, sour, bitter, salt, and savory to choose from. But with so few basic tastes, how then do we explain the myriad flavors we experience when we eat? The answer lies in the mysterious relationship between these two chemical senses, that indefinable point where our sense of smell meets our sense of taste, the sensation we all experience as flavor. Chef Claudio Aprile has worked in the world's top restaurants. Now, his new restaurant, Colburn Lane, is the darling of Toronto's fine dining scene. The food is experimental, and the flavor intense. I'm gonna add some orange to this as well. And the uh, lime is obviously really sour, so it'll kind of uh, counteract one another. You have a little bit of sweet and sour going on. I've always been, I think, very paranoid of creating a dish that is bland, so through that, I guess, paranoia, I've created dishes that are very heightened, very intense in flavor, very concentrated, a little more flavor to this. To invent such flavors, Claudio's sense of taste and smell must be very finely tuned. But science has only recently revealed the mechanics behind how they work. Our tongues are covered with small bumps called papillae that contain our taste buds. Food molecules diluted in saliva enter the papillae and react with receptors on the taste bud's membranes. The five basic tastes, sweet, sour, bitter, salt, and savory, are uniquely structured molecules that fit into receptors with complementary shapes. These interactions produce electrical impulses that travel along nerve fibers into the brainstem and then onto the cortex where they are identified. The mechanism by which we detect smells is much more complex. When we sniff, airborne molecules bounce through our nasal passages. Most are sucked into our lungs as we breathe. But a few hit a patch of neurons called the olfactory epithelium, located at the top of each nostril. The epithelium contains about 5 million receptor cells, of which there are 350 or more different types. A single odor will typically stimulate a number of receptor types across the olfactory epithelium, creating a pattern of electrical activity distinct for that odor. The staggering number of possible patterns 
allows us to discriminate anywhere from 10 to 100,000 different odors. These electrical patterns travel along the olfactory nerve to the brain. That's intense. It's these patterns that allow us to distinguish the smell of lemon from that of coffee. The perception of flavor also includes the feel, temperature, and sting of food, sensations which are sent to our brain along the trigeminal nerve. I think in general, people sort of do take their senses of smell and taste for granted. And the one case where they don't is when they lose it. Because when, when somebody abruptly loses their sense of smell, which is quite common, or their sense of taste, which is very uncommon, this can cause real, real uh, dismay and uh, even, even worse. Pam Cathre of Belleville, Ontario, has had a lifelong appreciation for fine foods and wine. Her good taste became her life when she began working as a wine consultant. When it came to my career, it seems like the job that I ended up getting was something that I'd been working towards all of my life. But Pam's life was interrupted by an accident with an unexpected consequence. February 16th, my husband and I were curling. We were sweeping this rock into the house, and I guess I stood up too fast. And then I fell back and hit my head on the ice. I went to my tasting on Wednesday in Kingston, my vintages tasting, and nosed the first glass of red wine. I usually start with red. And I couldn't smell anything. And I took a sip of it, and I couldn't taste it. And at that point, I think I tried another wine. I didn't say anything. I tried another wine. And the same thing happened. And I realized that I had no sense of smell. I was in absolute panic. I can still remember sitting there. I just couldn't believe it, that something that I was so passionate about had been taken away from me in an instant. It's been a crushing blow to me, to, to who I am and uh, what I was accomplishing in life. So I'm uh, very depressed about it. Pam's deep sense of loss harkens back to the primal nature of smell. Those of us in the field believe that, that the chemical senses are the most primary of all senses, that these single-celled organisms you know, had to do two things. They had to get nutrients, and they detected nutrients by their chemical nature, and they had to mate and reproduce. And so the smell system and the taste system evolved out of this very primitive chemosensory system to solve those two problems. And those two problems are still the ones that are most important for us. Even after millions of years of evolution, these sensory reactions to outside chemical stimuli may still be informing our most primal instincts, including that of procreation. What we assume is that each person exudes a pattern of volatiles that are floating off the person. Do humans use odors for social and sexual communication? And I'd say there's good evidence that they do. The question is how much, how often, and how does that work? Some studies suggest women are subconsciously attracted to the smell of a man whose immune system is different from their own. What a woman should be looking for is a man that's somehow going to maximize the likelihood that her offspring is going to be healthy. The genetic representation of what gives you your unique body odor happens to be your unique immune system. Potentially, women could smell the most biologically compatible mates for themselves. But how does smell affect our other primal function, that of eating? To 
today, science continues to broaden our understanding of these chemical senses. Claudio Aprile has volunteered to undergo a series of tests to gauge his sensitivity to tastes and smells. The result may help us understand how our olfactory and taste worlds may differ from person to person. We first take Claudio to New York's Rockefeller University to determine how sensitive he is to smells. Researchers here found that specific gene mutations can alter how we perceive different smells. For example, there are three genetic variations of the receptor for androstenone. I know that smell. A chemical found in sweat. Depending on the variation present in the study subject, androstenone smelled like stale urine, vanilla, or was not detected at all. This could be true for other odors as well. It's pretty sweet. In this test, Claudio smells hundreds of odors and ranks them according to intensity and pleasantness. He's also asked to describe the odors using a list of words provided to him. Buttery, fresh. Words like floral, fruity, musky. Claudio's test results are dramatic. In sensitivity, he ranks in the top 6%. I'm a super sniffer, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, you are. Um, but there's another then, more uh, curious the result. You have a very strange perception of musky odors. So you're normal for vanilla and peppermint, um, but musk doesn't smell like musk to you. The ability to smell something like a musky odor can tend to run in families. So if your mother and father can't smell a musk, you, as a child of those parents, may also not be able to smell that musk. So we believe that there is a strong genetic component of being able to smell something or not be able to smell something. Genetics determines the different olfactory sensitivities observed across species. Canines are particularly endowed with a finely tuned sense of smell. But how finely tuned is it? In this study, the dog is trained to identify a target odor contained in one of these tubes. The other four hold blanks. What we found was that the, the lowest concentration of this chemical uh, in amyl acetate that the dog can detect is on the order of one part uh, per trillion. That's 10,000 to 100,000 fold lower uh, than the threshold we found using the same chemical in our laboratory uh, with humans. This could be because the dog has about 220 million odor receptors, 40 times the number found in humans. If we're talking about vision instead of olfaction, the dog would be able to see from here in Tallahassee, Florida to Los Angeles about as well as the human would be able to see one third of a mile. A lot of people do ask though, how is it that a dog, if they have this high sensitivity, how in the world can they live in our sensory world and not sort of be overloaded? The simple answer is we don't understand their neural mechanisms that allow them to have that range. It's a real important question, it's a real mystery. Charles Greer is a neuroscientist with Yale University. His research, comparing human anatomy to that of other animals, is raising startling possibilities. Inside the olfactory bulb are millions of axon fibers, each carrying odor signals from the nose. They wind around each other, forming knots called glomeruli. The glomeruli combine thousands of signals from the nose into simpler messages the rest of our brain can manage. Previous studies of mice and rats have shown two glomeruli for each type of odor receptor, about 2,000 in total. But Greer was the first to look inside the human olfactory bulb, and he discovered humans, on average, have 5,000 glomeruli, more than twice as many as rodents. So instead of the two-to-one model, we suddenly find ourselves with an eight-to-one model. And we think this has important implications 
for predicting or understanding the ability of humans to detect and discriminate odors. I would argue, based upon our evidence, that perhaps it, it in some respects is more sophisticated or is capable of more sophistication than, um, than we've realized or taken the time to recognize in the past. Two months after losing her sense of smell, Pam Cathre took a stress leave from her job as a wine consultant. I'm finding it difficult to mentally cope with the loss of such an important sense for me. I've had a few reactions like, well, even though you can't taste wine anymore, um, you can still just be a cashier and do stock at, at your work. And to me, that's, yes, I could do that. But to me, that's like telling, telling a surgeon who has a, an injury with their hand and can no longer operate that, yeah, you can still be in the operating room, but we're just going to have you run a machine. We're not going to have you do what you're passionate about doing, but yes, you can still do something else. And some people, again, probably more the ones that don't know me very well, don't understand why I wouldn't just settle for that. In losing her sense of smell, Pam is no longer able to experience flavor to the degree her brain has come to expect. Claudio, on the other hand, is able to explore flavor to its fullest. What I have in this bowl here is uh, beet juice, which has been cooked out with sodium alginate. And in this concoction here, I have water, which has calcium chloride. When the two are mixed together, they react and they create a sphere, basically a little encapsulation. So what I've achieved here is serving ingredients that are very familiar in flavor, but in a very unfamiliar presentation. One of the truisms of smells is we don't have words for them. Odors are things that we describe as smells like. Smells like an apple, smells like a cherry, smells like a tomato, um, smells awful, smells good. But we don't have words like we do for colors. Some people are definitely more responsive to them. Some people are definitely more attentive to them. Some people are definitely better able to identify them, describe them, and pay attention to them. Quite a mixture of flavors. <laughs> Texture, palate there. That's a lot more savory than I was. I think it was. Because I was expecting a far more... Radishy radish? Like a stronger, sharper taste that I'm familiar with radish, and it just didn't have that. It was insanely subtle and, and sublime, actually. Oh, wow. Insanely subtle and sublime. That's a nice way to put it. <laughs> But perhaps the most intriguing characteristic of smell is its ability to evoke memories, even before a particular smell has been fully recognized. Smells associated with old books are, to me, amongst the best. Now, other people would describe them as musty and kind of stinky and whatever, but to me, when I walk into an old bookstore and anywhere in the world, there's the same smell. That, that smell that, that comes out of there takes me back to when I was a kid. It just brings back these, these wonderful, wonderful memories. The sense of smell is the most primitive of, of senses. The very primitive parts of the brain were attached to the, to the olfactory system. So now those pathways are still there. Nature makes use of their very old, uh, old uh, parts of the brain. And so when we smell things, the, the smells first pass through the limbic system. This is different than vision and hearing. They don't, they, don't, they don't go to that stage first. So they go to parts of the brain that are more analytical first, whereas the olfaction goes through the parts that are more emotional, emotive, and then through the secondary pathway, 
to, to the parts that are more analytical. Rachel and I have a colleague, actually, who was at the University of Pennsylvania. After the Vietnam War, she agreed to adopt a young Vietnamese who, who was about 16, but he was brought to the US you know, from Vietnam, never been, couldn't speak English, totally can imagine how frightening that was. And uh, our, our friend lived in a big house in, in the suburbs, and, and uh, he described later him coming to this house and walking up and being so terrified of what this was about. And the woman who was knowledgeable about this decided to cook a Vietnamese uh, food. And so when they opened the door to let him in, he took a sniff of the food, and all of a sudden he relaxed because this was going to be OK. The, this, the smell took him back to, to where he was. I remember being in Europe and, and smelling this tea that somebody was drinking beside me, and it was a yellow tea, and I was like, I didn't know what it was. Tea? <laughs> no, it was vervin. And I remember being a very small child, and my grandmother from St. Kitts, that she had two different types of bushes. One was sweet bush, one was bitter bush. The sweet bush was vervin, and it was the same, same French vervin. It was so it brought you back to your instantly. childhood? It makes sense to think that odors could trigger emotions even before we start to think about what they are, where they came from, or why they're affecting us. We're trying to understand how these emotional memories are formed to odors, and in particular, how to remove the potency of that association if in fact it's a negative one, and more importantly, how to block it from occurring. Dalton is particularly interested in smells that remind people of highly stressful situations, like war or disasters. She suspects these types of olfactory memories have the potential to trigger bouts of post-traumatic stress. To prove this link, her lab must subject study participants to two things simultaneously. A, this red chair. a new odor and high stress. Claudio Aprile is once again our test subject. I'll see you in 10 minutes. Unbeknownst to him, an odor called galbanum, similar to cedar, is pumped into the environmental chamber. It's time to take off your nose clips. Claudio smells the galbanum and shows no reaction. Lab technician Chris Maudi springs on his unwitting subject a series of tasks designed to cause stress. Your task for today is going to be to give a speech, a five-minute speech, on global warming, whether you believe that it exists or it doesn't, and why you have the opinion that you do. The speech is going to be video and audio taped. Both of those tapes are going to be played for a panel of judges. They're going to grade you on both persuasiveness and content, so I suggest that you do the best job that you can. You can begin. Um, based on uh, the current um, weather changes, um, i.e. the increase of uh, flooding, tornadoes, uh, droughts, how much time do I have left? All right. You can see his heart rate's already increasing. You still have four minutes. Four minutes? Oh, my god. All right, there's one more task for today, and that's gonna be a mental arithmetic task. You're gonna start at 1,022 and count backwards in increments of 13. You can begin now. Okay, 1,022. 1,009. Yeah, I can't do it. I'm just not feeling us. Claudio is clearly uncomfortable. His tasks complete, the technician pumps more galbanum into the chamber. The smell he once found innocuous, he now finds foul. Black is horrible. There's a reaction. And I also like to point out his heart rate is getting faster right now as we speak because his heart rate is increasing, and that's the endpoint we use to determine stress response. Man, that was weird. Okay, you can stand up and follow me. Oh. 
This concludes the first half of the experiment. It will resume the following day. My inspiration for actually looking at this kind of experience was due to something that happened to me a number of years ago where I was attacked in an elevator by someone who apparently had a very distinctive odor associated with them. I think they were sniffing glue. A couple of months after that, I was visiting a friend and their child was putting together a model car. And again, there must have been this distinctive smell of glue in the environment. I had the same reaction. I got dizzy, my heart started to race, my throat closed up, I felt sweaty. And it was only then that I said, there's something clearly going on here I have to figure out. The next day, Claudio returns to the chamber. This time around, though, there will be no stressful tasks, just the odor. Just like yesterday, make the ratings on the computer based on how you feel right now at this moment. OK. After you're done with that, just like yesterday, you're going to sit in here for 10 minutes while I monitor your resting heart rate. As he did the day before, Chris pumps the galbanum into the chamber. Our hypothesis would be that as soon as he removes his nose clips today and re-smells the odor from yesterday, it'll trigger his body to go back into a stress response as evidenced by an increase in heart rate. It's time to remove your nose clips. <laughs> Oh, God, it stinks. Immediately make a rating of stress and anxiety on the pages with the number three on them. Oh. What have I got myself into here? Am I anxious? I'm very anxious. He's clearly under some state of autonomic arousal. <clears throat> Even without the stressful tasks, Claudio's heart rate is racing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's all good, it's yeah. All good. yeah. 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 <laughs> you were a definite sport. You were, <laughs> you came back. We're sorry to have caused you such stress, but that was actually the main point of the experiment. There were moments when there was nothing happening and I could feel myself getting agitated, angry, um, just anxious and, um, it was very bizarre. In stark contrast, Pam Cathray remains disconnected from her olfactory sense. For her, adjusting to life without smell has been difficult. Unfortunately, with losing your sense of smell, it, it's not like somebody being handicapped because they're blind or because they can't hear. When you lose your sense of smell, it's it's a hidden handicap. Well, not all the peppers are hot. Some of them are actually fruity. The pink peppercorns are sweet and fruity. Well, I have no sense of smell. Oh, OK. And uh, um, one of the only things that I can taste is salt. We also have smoked salts, which obviously have a very smoky aroma. Smell that. I won't be able to smell Oh, that. try. No, no, OK. I have to taste it. OK, well, that's fine. We can do that. There you go. It tastes like salt. It tastes like salt. <laughs> but salt and Unable to sense and any kind of aroma, there you go. her perception of flavor has been reduced to the combinations afforded by her sense of taste alone. Though that isn't to say taste lacks the capacity to perceive great subtlety. We've come to the University of Florida in Gainesville to next test our chef's sense of taste. The focus here will be on Claudio Aprile's tongue. The blue dye will highlight his fungiform papillae, the bumps on the tongue that contain taste buds. The papillae will be counted to see if he has more than average. If he does, Claudio may have been born what psychologist and taste researcher Linda Bartoshuk has dubbed a super taster. The super taster is living, we, we describe it as a neon taste slash food world compared to the non taster that's living in a more pastel world. He is an extreme super taster. If we sit across a table and both of us sample sugar crystals, 
he's getting three times as much sweetness as I am. Actually, in his case, it's probably more than that because he's on the extreme end of super tasters, probably four or five times as much sweetness. See this tongue? Those fungiform papilla look like polka dots. Your tongue looks like this. And you notice that you have many fungiform papilla. The number of fungiform papillae we have is an inherited trait. About 25% of the population has a larger number of papillae compared to the number found in the rest of us. And it's more common in women than men. The super taster's tongue, crammed with papillae, not only has more taste buds, but also more touch fibers that heighten the feel of food. Input from the taste buds and touch fibers result in a flood of impulses up the corda tympani, glossopharyngeal and trigeminal nerves, and into his brain. And the signals your brain is getting from fat are far more intense than the signals my brain is getting. The super taster doesn't like high fat foods for the most part, so they have an advantage in cardiovascular disease. On the other hand, super tasters often find the bitter taste or textural characteristics of vegetables unpleasant. They eat fewer vegetables, so they have a higher risk for things like colon cancer, where a vegetable intake really matters. I'll never look at my tongue the same way. We've now confirmed that Claudio possesses both super-sensitive taste and smell. But that still doesn't explain how he is able to combine the two. What we've done here is we've changed the presentation of the squid. We've cut it in a certain way, so when it cooks, it doesn't actually look like squid. It looks like, I guess, almost like pasta. And then the citrus from the grapefruit enhances the lime. and It's all about having different textures kind of play off one another. That's it. Yeah, yeah that's excellent. That's yes. beautiful. It's got Smell. Some lines. The no, thing. It's very good. The, the, yeah, give me yeah, that yeah. one. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's a good long to be It's like almost a saute. And what's nice is the fact that you actually have to think and taste it. Yeah. How often do you do that? Yeah. This you can actually experience the food. Mm -hmm. But if the experience of flavor can't be attributed to either taste or smell alone, is there a physical point where the two senses somehow converge? Hi, Claudio. Hi, how are you? Good, thank you. Researchers you? led by Canadian Dana. neuroscientist Dana Small at the John B. Pierce Laboratory in Connecticut are helping us find out. The mask delivers small puffs of air scented with chocolate. The functional MRI will record if anything out of the ordinary happens in his brain when he smells them. It does. His piriform, or olfactory cortex, the next part of the brain after the olfactory bulb that responds to smells, is twice as active as the average brain. This is another indicator of his higher sensitivity to smell. Three, two, one, sniff. Did you get that? Yeah. But there's an even more interesting result. It involves the orbitofrontal cortex, the brain structure that researchers like Dana Small theorize combines smell and taste inputs to create the perception of flavor. It's also important in the perception of pleasantness. When exposed to the control smell, Claudio's orbitofrontal cortex lights up much sooner than that of the average brain. So how, how may that help me as a chef? Well, it, what it means is that you're probably better able to um, evaluate flavors and odors and perhaps hold them in memory longer, uh, compare them to earlier memories. Uh, so really, your ability to uh, think about flavors is uh, is really quite sophisticated. And so I would just think that that should translate into some very unique and uh, elaborate dishes. Are you relieved? Yeah, <laughs> I've got a big food brain, I guess. And that makes sense, because it's all I read. There's you know, food magazines, cookbooks. And you know, what I do is I'm, I'm a chef. I spend 12, 13, 14 hours a day cooking. So it makes sense that I have a larger capacity for food. Yeah, Jenny, do you have your... Uh... The study shows Claudio that his abilities to perceive taste and smell aren't simply innate. They're in a state of constant development. 
His every sensory perception, be it a pungent whiff of coriander or the bitter taste of grapefruit, is being constantly re-evaluated based on previous experience stored in memory. In this way, the more we use our brains to evaluate tastes and smells, the more proficient we become. And in Claudio's case, the results are extraordinary explorations of flavor. We're kind of tricking you in a way. We're adding liquid nitrogen to the soy, freezing it, turning it into a powder. And then the tuna and the watermelon kind of, uh, I think they mess with you a little bit. Oh, wow. As they eat, our guests are experiencing this particular dish oh, for the first time. Wow. A little foreshadowing. <laughs> this is Committing awesome. its unique flavors it to memory. Oh, it smells good. But what happens if the brain's wiring is severely disrupted? As in the case of Pam Cathre, when one of the senses is removed entirely, how does the brain react? Despite her disability, Pam is using her remaining sensory inputs to find food she enjoys. Her likes and dislikes are now based totally on just the texture and taste of food. And the food she once loved may now hold little appeal. I'm having more of this type of meal now because I need something with texture. Honey lemon chicken and the garlic croutons, the bacon is still in there, good Caesar salad dressing. Gives me a lot of textures to kind of play with. So what I look for in foods now are foods that are spicier probably than what I might have used to have had. I quite often can get a little bit of citrus, um, just the, the sour part of them. It is encouraging, okay. but for a lover of fine food, overcoming the loss of her sense of smell will be a long and difficult process. There's absolutely no enjoyment anymore in eating. Thank you. Thank you for Barbara. A lot of the things that, that we have done together as well as a couple and with friends revolved around food and good wine and travel in relation to wine and food. And that, the, the edge has gone off that, if you will. The, the, it's, it's not, uh, it doesn't have the same attraction for Pam as it does for the rest of us. My hope is that they find some sort of a cure for what's happened to me and that I get my sense of smell back. That's my hope. Mm -hmm. The loss of smell is debilitating and potentially dangerous. People like Pam can't react quickly to smoke or fumes. But there are other olfactory disorders that can also have an impact on quality of life. Doctors Donald Leopold and David Hornung are trying to identify the root causes of these disorders. A woman would walk past me and I know that she has perfume on. I mean, to me, it still smells like burnt rubber. <laughs> so it doesn't attract me. Right. But in fact, if anything, it puts me off. In fact, it does put me off. We asked before about smells that come on with no smells in the environment. And is that, does that ever happen? I remember recently standing in the middle of my living room um, and suddenly getting a smell. I mean, it was the mm -hmm. distorted smell. But it came and then it went. This kind of smell distortion is a rare condition, okay. and there's relatively little known about it. So here we are Leopold and Horning will conduct a physical examination and a series of tests to obtain as much information as they can. But often these disorders show no physical signs. Because we know so little about the sense of smell, especially clinically, and because we don't have very good therapies, uh, physicians in general don't learn much about this. These patients don't get much information. They will be told by someone who really does know this area that there's nothing we can do. And they just, they can't believe it. Hello. Pam has come to see if there is any immediate hope her condition Hello. can Hello. be My reversed. David Horning. Hi. Don Leopold, nice Hi. to see you. Nice Thank to you. See you. Thanks for coming. Okay. So you haven't noticed any return of, at all, of, of your sense of smell? Absolutely Have nothing. you noticed any 
smells that were sort of there that weren't in the environment? No. Okay. You mean phantasms? Phantoms and, no, and distortions. No. But you you haven't had anything, nothing no. to distort. Okay. No. Did at some at some point it occur to you, hey, you know, uh, I remember how nice this smelled, and I see them and um, lilacs. I'm that sorry, was, they're not there. I yeah, I planted a lilac tree at our house, and they were always. And I bloomed, always and it, it bloomed, bloomed the spring, and, and it was I used a, to go around town and steal other people's lilacs as well, <laughs> and have them in my house, and they'd be in the bedroom and in the bathroom and everywhere. I just loved the smell of lilacs, right. and, and nothing, this nothing. Year. No. Okay. You're basically going to take the lead of your pencil and scratch the brown pad there, and. After you've done that, you smell it. But you have, you have to pick one of four. So you have to pick one of those four. Pam is given a smell identification test to measure her overall olfactory performance. The 40 scratch and sniff pads replicate smells we often encounter in an everyday environment. The average score for someone Pam's age should fall somewhere in the mid 30s. You're at pretty much as rock bottom as you can get. You scored eight out of 40 correct. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, Good guesses. Uh, well, yeah. well. <laughs> All that you had significantly damaged your sense of smell. We don't know whether that was damaged as those nerves come out of the top of your nose and go into your brain, or whether you banged up those parts of your brain that you use to do smelling. That the current understanding of this is, as you've probably learned, that we don't know of any way to get this back. Now, you don't know of any surgical uh, answers to, to for this? To what you got? No, no. No. And it could be that it, your, smell, your sense of smell will start returning tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, although unlikely, it, it does happen. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's possible that, that things may return, although, again, the likelihood of that given your history and given our experience, it is, is that I'm afraid, not, not, very, not very likely. Yeah. We're going to go through right. those stages of grief yeah. with regard to losing this part yes. of you. Yes. And, and well, it's and like losing an arm. my job. Yeah. It was yeah. my life. Exactly. You're yeah. totally so correct. Yeah. I'm battling that. For the majority, smell like sight and hearing, will fade with age, but it's a decline we may not notice. If we look at people 50, 60, 70, and 80 years old, and we ask them, how is your sense of smell? Um, they typically say, um, it's pretty good. We did an experiment where we gave them a smell test, and what we found was that indeed, there was profound smell loss and people were unaware of that loss. So what we're gonna do is you're gonna smell out of this nose piece every 30 to 60 seconds. And what you wanna do is every time you get the smell, just hit this button. Okay. So just when I smell anything? Just when you get a smell, right? Okay. Okay? Shoot. We're getting closer and closer every day to that. Oh, thank you. At San Diego State University, researchers are investigating how natural aging impairs smell. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that good, huh? <laughs> what do you think that is? Certainly smells like a food. Yeah, I'm afraid I can't place that one. The normal younger person would have no difficulty naming any of those odors. And so there seems to be a significant effect on the ability to just pull that name out of memory and connect that with incoming olfactory information about what the smell is. In healthy people, smell loss begins gradually, around the age of 50 or later. But researchers like Claire Murphy have discovered that profound smell loss at this age may be an indication of something more serious than simply getting older. Over the past few years, she has conducted smell tests on a group of volunteers, some of whom have a mutation in their genes making them susceptible to Alzheimer's. Unlike those without the mutation, their smell loss is more acute at an earlier age. A person in the silent stages of Alzheimer's disease, that is a person who could walk into a neurologist's office and seem to be normal, um, 
If he's developing Alzheimer's disease, we'll be developing tangles in this area of the brain. This, of course, is the entorhinal cortex. Rhino meaning nose, this is an area that processes olfactory information. The relationship between olfaction and Alzheimer's disease could be part of the um, early intervention. As drugs become available, we would know who needs to have the drug. And that's what drives a lot of my research, understanding who's going to need that um, so that they can be targeted at the right people at the right time and help as many people as possible. I didn't squeeze it. Yeah, you got it. Mm. Over the summer, Claudio told us about certain odors that trigger memories. We asked Pam Dalton and Chris Mowdy of the Monell Chemical Senses Center to devise oh. a simple recognition test. Mm-hmm. That reminds me of something from my childhood. Mm. My mother wears a something that's similar to that. Oh, this perfume she wears. Don't need to look at it first. Sorry. Oof. That's wolf. That's horrible. Do you recognize it? Don't want to recognize it. Oh. I don't know what it is, but... But it makes you feel bad? Just agitates me. I don't know what it is. It's just something in there that's... All right. <laughs> this is cooked liver. That is horrific, that smell to me. You mm. had a very visceral reaction Oof. to it. Yeah. yeah. I, I definitely associate liver with, with a very bad experience, a very bad time. Right. Yeah. When I was a kid, uh, my mother got quite ill. My sister and I were told that she wasn't going to make it and uh, we were put in a group home, or actually a foster home, where they would eat liver a lot, and it was never, um, it was a forced issue, so you had no choice but to eat it, and um, that's probably where that, that, that is where that comes from. It brought me back to that experience, and I've never cooked liver in any of the kitchens that I work in. It's an intense reaction one that demonstrates the latent power of our olfactory sense. But Pam Cathre, isolated from the world of smells, no longer experiences these odor-triggered memories. However, her developing taste for spices and textures is a sign that her brain may be compensating for the loss of smell. Let's go, get the food on the plate, guys. Come on. We've arranged for Pam and her husband Rick to dine at Colburn Lane. It's an opportunity to see if a master chef can do what science can't. That is to bring excitement back to food. Okay, here's a little bit of uh, iced tuna. Whatever I mean, it's crunchy. Well, it's got all kinds of different textures. You know, every bite's different. And all I seem to be getting is the salt. I got a little bit of the ginger. I found the soy was a little bit too salty for me. Overall, I'd say for me, the dish was a bit too salty. But again, I'm getting, I may be getting the salt and not not having it balanced by any of the other flavors. Hi. Next, Claudio serves one of his trademark dishes. So here you have the uh, squid. Tasty. All I'm getting is the texture of it. The, and I'm getting the heat from the chili. Mm -hmm. I have to admit, it's, it, it is very uh, disheartening for me to, to, to cook for you because I want more reaction. and. I mean, I'm getting reactions from you, but yeah. you know, I, I'm used to getting either you know pretty extreme reactions to, to what we do here, good or bad. Right. So right. Uh, when you get an indifferent reaction, when I get one anyway, I find it a little bit, bit it's a big pill to swallow for me. And here we've got uh, beef with uh, an egg that's been poached at a very low temperature. Could be in heaven. <laughs> Melting your mouth? Mm. 
Though she can't perceive the complex flavors, Pam reacts to the tastes and textures of each dish. Not to mention the experience of dining out again. Thank you. So how did you make out? Very good. That was uh, one of the nicest pieces of beef tenderloin I think I've ever had. Wow. The texture was beautiful on it. So done perfectly and... If I lost my sense of smell or, or taste, I, I, you know, I would be completely devastated. Uh, like my whole world would be, would end. I'd probably give up my ability to walk if I had a choice, to, you know, whether it was my sense of smell and taste or being able to walk, I'd probably say, okay, fine, I won't walk anymore. Yeah. Because it's like, it is my entire world. It's really nice to talk to somebody who understands um, the devastation that I felt when I realized that I'd lost my sense of smell uh, due to my accident. Because there's a lot of people that really don't understand how much importance there is in their lives with, with their nose. Until it's gone. Until it's gone. This will be, I think, the smoothest ice cream you'll ever have. We are all different. We are all hardwired in a different way. And you can't generalize with smell and taste. Everyone has their own, um, I guess, their own barcode. For me as a chef, I've realized that um, if someone doesn't like something, it's not really, you should not take it personally because it's something that they have no control over. I think the senses really control us. I don't think we control them. It's part of who you are. It's like your fingerprints. It's what makes us individuals.